I know some people are still eating outside, uh, but if all you need is love, you don't need lunch, right? <laughs> so, so welcome everyone. Uh, I think it's somewhat uh, a sign of the times that we have a session on all you need is love at the Academy of Management. I don't know, I was talking with a couple of people, would you think that was something that was on the program two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago? Um, not sure, probably not. I would not have felt comfortable using that language in writing a proposal for the Academy of Management or even approaching people <laughs> that we have here as panelists to even think about this. And I think it is probably one of these master values, uh, master virtues that, that we're pushed to think about more uh, as we see the state of the world moving towards sort of opposites <laughs> and uh, well, hate uh, other fracturing mechanisms. And so if we're talking about the inclusive organization, I think we need, we need to go back to these master virtues, these uh, principles that unite. Uh, and it's about the inclusive organization this time. And, um, and I think it's, it's fitting to at least start thinking about this topic. It's reflected in most of the pop songs that we know, uh, most of the cultural memes in, across cultures uh, that have staying power. So it's an important kind of concept that we may have under accessed or underutilized in thinking. I want to just share the genesis of this uh, conversation it was with uh, uh, intellectual shaman format that the International Humanistic Management Association hosts that Sandra Waddock uh, uh, held. And we had uh, Jim Walsh with us. And one of the questions was like, how, Jim, uh, did you, what Sandra was saying, become an intellectual shaman? And I let <laughs> Sandra maybe explore more about or share more about this. And it sort of struck us, or me, listening, that Jim was starting by saying, I think it came out of the unconditional love that my parents gave to me. And we haven't known each other for that long, and I think there was a whole community that was part of that, a global community, and that these words came out of your mouth, Jim, as a first response, that was something that struck me. And I think that was something that sparked more thought and more conversation and reflection in a way that, you know what, I think there is more there there. It may have been some casual remark, maybe a casual pop song in some way referenced, and there's so much more. And then you said that you had a conversation with Jay about this subject, and I said, wow, you know what, that's good. We need to access the full humanity in this academy of management to get to these issues, because it is about organizing, it is about management, even though we don't speak about it that much. And that is only something that came clearer to me as I was thinking about these things, and I think I'm very grateful that Jim, that you're here, Sandra, that you're here, Jay, that you're here, and Raj, that could come. Um, to explore these issues with you together. So it's an invitation to think about this and maybe feel like these, th these are important concepts that we need to be more bold to embrace in our work, teaching, outreach, uh, and definitely research. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for being here. And uh, I want to share that David Sloan Wilson, unfortunately, is stuck in Galapagos. Yeah. <laughs> I don't love that guy at all. But he managed to sort of send me a video of his remarks, and we'll see that, okay, um, if the tech works. And for those of you who don't know about uh, David Sloan Wilson, he is one of the famed bi uh, evolutionary biologists. And he's talking about love and altruism and all those concepts that he thinks have been misunderstood in what we sort of typically consider Darwinian. And, and what makes survival possible. And I think it's a time of species survival where we need to figure out what has worked in the past. Why are we here as representative of other species and, and how can we ensure that our species may have a better chance of survival going on. So going back to evolutionary insights may be quite fitting. And I don't, think how, I don't know how many of you are actually uh, looking at Darwin and putting the word love and morality next to it. Uh, I do think there is a whole narrative shift that needs to happen, and this is part of the conversation on how to do that, uh, integrating the sciences. So thanks again. I'm going to just show David's video to kick us off, and then we're going to have uh, Jay uh, share some remarks, and uh, Tim, uh, Sandra, and then Raj. So, and then there will be time for some questions, 
and I'm hoping that you can think about questions, short questions, that means they're short, and then they end with a question mark. <laughs> Thank you. preeminent scholars in our field, so thank you so much for taking the time to come. Uh, and as I was preparing these remarks, I uh, was talking to my wife about them, and uh, she said, I didn't know you did this stuff. <laughs> some field work, but not much. I mean, I, I try to develop theory that answers uh, theory, interesting theoretical questions. And so it's a very abstract process for me. But ironically, I have a parallel life, which is I do a fair amount of consulting with companies. And um, I saw something in the companies with which I work that I did not understand. And, um, and Jim and I were actually in a conference together. And uh, it's a conference that was, uh, has uh, it's a small group, and there's a bunch of philosophers and a bunch of economists and a few business school people. And it turns out that the, the, the caricature uh, that uh, philosophers and economists have of business is so wrong. It, it actually is, oh, well, you must be, must be all uh, just you know, narrow-minded. And, and in fact, my experience with business, especially in some settings, is that it's a emotionally rich, love-filled experience and can be sometimes. And so uh, that gave me a, a moment to think about uh, what I was learning. So, um, there. Can you adjust the microphone? A little louder? Thank you. Also. Better? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So um, I work with a variety of different kinds of clients and they all have different needs. So this is going to be about this, I'm going to embed this in my consulting experience, which is also very unusual for me. Um, I have uh, I have clients that I call uh, that get strategic oil changes. These are not uh, these are not firms that are failing in any really important sense. They're just testing uh, just the assumptions of their business, but they're pretty confident about how things are going. And uh, and I come in and I facilitate a day or two, and we have a nice conversation, and, and then we move on. Um, and there's a, another class of firms that are facing uh, significant uh, changes in their competitive context. Um, I have examples of all these. Uh, for example, I have a, a client, an automobile company, that is, you know, makes cars, makes money, they're good cars, all these other things go on. But they have things, little things in their environment that they're worried about, like uh, self-driving cars, collective ownership of cars, and electric cars. Besides that, there's nothing important going on in there. <laughs> And they, but the thing is interesting that they know what those challenges are. Now, they don't know for sure how to respond to them, but they, they have a pretty good sense of the dimensions of the problems that are associated with those challenges. I have a, a functional fashion firm I worked with for many years that was, uh, was not able to grow uh, because of its current uh, position with its uh, supply, its, uh, uh, its retail outlets, and then a uh, casual dining restaurant that was trying to manage some growth changes as well. Uh, and these, these are uh, more complicated decision settings than the strategic goal change, but they're not as difficult as the last category, which is the uh, burning platform companies. And these are companies that are burning through cash. Uh, one of these clients was a microfinance company that after uh, an hour of analysis, they had, uh, they had 18 months to live. And they didn't know why they were burning through cash, uh, and, but they were, it was on the edge. And then a radiology group that I worked with for many years who basically, by, because of the, its powerful customers, was basically giving its services away, almost for free. I mean, a 95% discount off the retail price. So. 
and it's just killing these guys. And they don't know what's wrong. Because if they knew what's wrong, if they knew what the dimensions of the problem were, they would solve that. It's easy enough. You know, do analysis. But they, but they don't really even know what questions to ask, they don't know what questions, what, how, what those answers might be in this third category. So I thought about this for a while, and it's not hard to sort of uh, align these three kinds of clients in the decision-making context they operate in into these three, in this, on this dimension here. On the left-hand side, the strategic oil change people, they're, they're operating in what economists, and I am an economist, uh, call risky situations. That is, they don't know for sure what the outcome is, but they know the possible outcomes and know the probability distribution of those possible outcomes. There's a fair amount of knowledge that they're operating in that setting. Uh, the identical environmental strategic change sort of falls in the middle, and on the right side we have a burning platform where people are operating under conditions of what economists call nineteen uncertainty, where you know neither the possible outcomes associated with an exchange uh, with, with a transaction or a, or a strategy you're pursuing, nor the probability of those outcomes. This is the uh, famous unknown unknowns problem. And, uh, and the burning platforms, that's where you, now you add to the burning platform. Not only do you not know what the problems are, and not that's the solutions and their probability, but you have these incredible time pressures because you're running out of time. And those are pretty, uh, those are pretty extreme settings here. So, Again, as I, as I thought about trying to generalize from this experience, I thought, um, oh, this is a definition I already have. Um, how does one facilitate organizational change in these two settings? Um, and the risk is actually really well known. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, that's where economists really do work uh, out pretty well. Um, you analyze the strategic alternatives. You uh, collect data, either public or proprietary data, and you evaluate those alternatives, you have hypotheses, you test good scientific methods. And there is a social dimension even here, but it's a, it's a, it's a trust based on confidence. I, I, I know that my senior managers are talented and smart and will do the right work, and they know that I have the right skills, and together we will solve this problem. And under a certain end, that works, right? And right in certainty, um, you, you don't know that you can't analyze the two alternatives. They're changing rapidly, they're unknown, ex ante. Uh, there is no data. And in, in these settings, it's really funny. We, we, we used to run um, focus groups in these settings to ask customers what they thought the firm should do. And the customers have no idea because they, they don't know any better than the firm does. So. It's even competence-based trust is problematic in these settings because we don't know what the competencies are we should trust. So these were, these were my clients. I'm thinking, how can I facilitate change in an organization where I, when all the tools I have, which are in the top part of the screen, don't apply to the bottom part of the screen? So when you can't use analysis, public and proprietary <laughs> data, and competence-based Pays trust to facilitate strategic change. What do you do? What I found from my experience is that when employees, mostly direct reports, believe that their boss puts the employee's interests in front of their own interests, we see change. Now, I think that's the definition of love. And so, um, there's a lot of different um, uh, synonyms, uh, and I just looked these up, and some of them were compassion, care, regard, concern, friendliness, goodwill, fellowship, humanity, brotherhood, sisterhood. I would add a uh, sense of deep affection. And as we heard in the first talk, it sounds like uh, uh, that that shouldn't exist in, according to the traditional models, the models that I know well and have lived with for many years. And yet, in my experience, there is little doubt that uh, um, when there's no good, no good reason to change—that is, rational, risk-based reason to change. 
affection and commitment and love enable us to work together to change the organization and make it happen and, and save it. Maybe. So uh, I won't go through all these examples, but <coughs> this is not a rare event. It's not a common event, but it's not uh, totally unusual. Uh, the military has been studying for some time the relationship among military units, not generals, lieutenants, kind of thing, but the, the squad level. And the research there is compelling, absolutely compelling. Soldiers do not fight for God and country and the flag. They fight for each other because they love each other. And they use that language explicitly. In sports teams, the teams that come together with deep affection for one another who have each other's back in all settings, not just on the field of, of, of competition, um, outperform. We know entrepreneurial teams. Entrepreneurial teams are a particularly uh, common place where this will happen because they are often operating under conditions of night and uncertainty. When the only thing you can do is trust that, this, that the entrepreneur and the human capital, the people that the entrepreneur uh, brings together in the organization, have enough regard for each other that they will be able to work in a setting where it can't, it is not possible to know how the business will ultimately evolve. And that sense of other regard is a form of love. Skunk works in large, uh, and uh, technology companies are well established that there's a sense of affinity and, and love in those organizations, parts of those organizations. And finally, uh, senior, senior management teams uh, completing difficult tasks. I've uh, worked with uh, companies on mergers and acquisitions. And when you finish a, a successful merger and acquisition, there is an outpouring of affection that is uh, only can be described as life. It's a remarkable thing to see. So let me uh, briefly talk about what uh, I think the implications are for uh, us as scholars, if this is all true. So uh, we need a new class of management skills. It's not, it doesn't seem to me, that, so the, the, the ability to create love in an organization, in parts of an organization, it doesn't sound like in, this, in the standard leadership literature. Maybe it is, I'm not an expert, but it does not, it doesn't fit into the, you know, to the, into the standard typologies. And so what we really need is under what conditions how do managers, how, how, they, how, they, how can they be authentic? How can they be present? How can they be vulnerable? Those are all the preconditions of love in any relationship. And how do we do that in an organization? And I'll, by the way, I don't want to get too modern here because this is all, I don't want to go over the top and I want too much information. I know, I understand all that, but how can we have respectful, deep emotional commitment and, and, and in an organization, that is, most of the time, that's not what it's about. Much of the time. I, I, I put that as a training challenge to my uh, organizational behavior colleagues to see how to, to teach that. Uh, a, a couple more research questions come out, and I'll, and I'll finish with a couple slides here very quickly. So I have, how many comments? I have ex ante and ex post love. <laughs> the emotional bonds enable us to operate in deeply uncertainty, or does our, our ability to operate in deeply uncertain environments create our emotional bonds or both? I don't know the, I don't know the causal mechanism. I observe what happens, but I don't know the mechanism very well. When the, there's an interesting problem when the context shifts from an uncertain environment to a risky environment. Think about that. You've got this intense emotionality in this uncertain environment, and then the, the business evolves and people become disaffected because they don't they don't feel that same connection, that sense of love that they did in the good old days. And then there's turnover and bitterness. And I wonder about that dynamic. Another dynamic is when it, it's just from risky to uncertain. This is also um, happens when we have a very stable organization doing all the right things and making all the good choices. And then the world changes. And all of the contracts, implicit and explicit contracts and relationships that exist in their risk, 
and works so well, they don't work anymore. And, and how does that organization then transform itself? That's uh, a really hard question. I don't know the answer. So um, I'm pretty sure that love is not all you need. <laughs> But uh, I will say this, in the 50 or so companies I've worked with over the years, um, I have never seen successful, fundamental strategic change where there was not a deep sense of love between the CEO and his or her direct reports. Mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, so if we can learn how to train and communicate that, I think we have a, a really interesting alternative period. Thank you. person that doesn't need as much introduction is Jim Walsh. <laughs> I think maybe you're the one that, that needs to respond to the challenge that was thrown out in terms of what we as the OB group can or needs to do. Um, but this was coming, this whole conversation came out of a comment that, that you made that we had as a conversation. So, I'm particularly interested in where your thoughts have come and gone, and I, do you want to use the floor this way, or do sure. you prefer to use this way? Yeah, can I just, you just need a shout? I'll, I'll try, okay. I will try to come down off, <laughs> off the mountaintop, uh, and if I, if I cannot be heard, because someone back two-thirds of the way said, we can't hear you, Jay. If I can't be heard, I'll come back up here and then bark into the microphone. So we'll, we'll try that. All right, okay. So okay. here, experiment. Because, um, Okay, you're the other canary in the coal mine. If you don't hear me, uh, and you, uh, let me know. <laughs> okay, um, I decided to do something, two things that I've never done in my 35 years of coming to the Academy of Management. One, to talk about love out loud, and to, two, to give a talk without a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> or, or in the old days, when Jay and I were doing this, the uh, multicolored grease pens, <laughs> the transparency. So we, we, we go back. You were a master of the multicolored grease pens. <laughs> Uh, I learned a lot from him over the years. Um, okay. Uh, if you notice, I've, I've noticed you've been taking pictures of us, and I've been taking pictures of you. Uh, and I started with one picture, and I said to Sandra, I need the pano to get this. And then she said, you know, sort of, what are you doing here? And then my thought is, um, um, if I live another 35 years, eh, we'll see, probably not. Um, I'd, I'd like to have this picture uh, to show again 10 years from now or something. This might be the start of something. Uh, and if it turns out it's not the start of something, I'm going to show this picture and say what happened to us. <laughs> so either way, I wanted a picture of this moment, and so now I have it. If anybody wants it, send me an email at jpwalsh at umich.edu. I'll send you the picture. So there we go. Um, okay, so uh, to the point about never having talked about love in this arena, I was thinking about coming in here, and I say, boy, this is... I have no idea what to expect, and you'll see in a second that I underestimated the audience size, um, or colleague size, whatever. Um, but I said there could be a sense of fundamental relief. Finally, we're going to talk about love. That could be in the air. It could be a sense of um, manifest excitement of, on the other side of finally we're going to talk about love. And I sensed that there was going to be a little bit of danger in the air of, whoa, <laughs> this is, uh, I've been hanging around those same philosophers and, and I know what they think of the likes of us and say, well, maybe we can't talk about love and all. Um, as we talk about it, um, I want to uh, show uh, one uh, uh, set of data with you. This is my only slide, and I decided to just bring a handout and give you the slide. Uh, and I brought 100 copies because, um, because, and Erica, God bless her, has some. So uh, take every other person, take a slide. It looks like there's a couple hundred people here. But you can pass them around and see what it is. But what I did is um, went into the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, archives, and I searched on seven key words from 1890 through the end of 2018, and it's, what are the words? Love was one of them, and then I looked at win, advantage, and beat, and virtue, caring, and compassion. People that know me know I've been doing this for a while, and I've looked at uh, win, advantage, beat, virtue, caring, and compassion over the years, but I had never put love in there. So my, my intuition is that love was going to be flatlined in the Wall Street Journal, just as virtue, caring, and compassion has been flatlined for 128 years. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, love is right up there with uh, win, advantage, and beat. Um, now, there are thousands of articles in the Wall Street Journal about love, 
and it might be brand love, I don't know. Now it's a challenge for, uh, there's one of our doctoral students in the room that I'm aware of, and she can go read these thousands of articles and tell me what's in there, but, um, or I will do it myself. Um, but there's the context. So love is in the air in the Wall Street Journal. And I will get the handout to my colleagues at the stage, as we know that. Um, so then that's one. Two, this is not your normal presentation of, uh, of discovery. I was thinking back to 1977 when I was alive. This is not Hannon and Freeman coming in to talk about population ecology. This is not Meyer and Rowan coming in to introduce institution theory. We know love matters. And so maybe this is just a reminder. It's a rediscovery of something. So that's, that's in the air. Um, what I would like to do in, in my time uh, today is to basically pose two questions. Um, why are we here? And then now what? Uh, the why are we here has two kinds of answers. One is a sociology of knowledge perspective about us as a community and why are we turning to this question and why are people sitting on the floor here. And then there's an individual answer to that question and Jay was going there with the, uh, the TMI issue. And I'm not sure there's actually TMI, but that's an empirical question. Of course, we will figure that out. Um, and so you have that. So there's a, a, a collective answer to the question about why. Oh, there's a collective answer to the question and then a personal answer to the question. And then now what is a personal answer? What are you, we as individuals going to do? And then what are we as a collective going to do? Uh, and I wanted to share some sense of the answers to that in my time remaining. And Erica is the timekeeper, and I have put my back to Erica. So, um, <laughs> I, But I, I will respect my colleagues because I do love them. So there. Uh, and, it's, and it's true. Um, to what, why are we here? I entered the field and came to my first academy of management was right around 1980. That's when I was in my PhD program. Um, and I, and the, what, I, what drew me to the field, I entered the field at the high water mark. And I wrote a paper in general management with two colleagues a number of years ago. We recoded every AMJ paper from the beginning. And that was the high water mark of the human relations movement in our field. And then it started to go down. And then if you look at any graphs of so many things in our world, everything changes in 1980 because that's when globalization hits. And then in our world, performance, performance, performance. And that's been going on for quite some time. Uh, but then we've been with this uneasy relationship of, well, whatever happened to human relations? And there's a whole story about globalization, why that matters. But we've been in the do good, do well, CSP, CFP relationship, CSR, corporate financial reform. All, we've been trying to live with, with both at some level. And we muddle along, and, and there we are. But something has changed. And it may be 30 years from now, we'll look back uh, and this, this is the moment where there's an inflection point. And the, the change is the Anthropocene, I believe. Um, and just the, and if you talk to the people that are uh, worried about human extinction, the, uh, the odds are, you for this, it's one in five chance of human extinction by the end of the century. And so there's an anchoring and adjustment. You can say, okay, well, there's an eight and, eight and ten chance of no human extinction, and we can, we can go on. But we're blithely moving forward as if we're fine. But there's, there's a threat that's in the air and I think in part, if we had to say what's the stimulus, it's the sense that the human species is at risk. Um, I was actually thinking about um, what our first colleague was saying, is that we are actually one of less than 20 species, uh, what I've read from our research biologists, and I wish he was here, but I, um, 20 species that uh, show ev any evidence of cooperation. The other thousands and thousands and thousands are kill or be killed, it's fully co competitive. And then the answer, what I've read, is what he said about self and group and all of that. So we have, that, we have the ability to cooperate, but we're mighty fearful. There's that tension, because we are as competitive as anyone else. And the question is, is how, do we, how do we combine the two? And in the moment of the Anthropocene, if this becomes a war of all against all, and there's signs that we could very well be in that, heading in that direction, we're done. Um, but if we have any chance of, of survival, it's going to be some kind of cooperation, perhaps. But it's a different kind of evolution of cooperation. Now we're trying to cooperate to save the entire species as opposed to my band beating your band. But I think that's what's in the air that has maybe prompted us to be here. Okay, so one question is, why are you here? Why are we here? I think it's the Anthropocene at some broad level has triggered us that we know something is up and it can't be business as usual. We have our own discrete questions of why are we here and we can, we'll answer that and that's, um, there are people in this room, you, I wanna know why, I think I know why you're here. But there are people, I'd like to hear everybody's stories if we can. Then the question is, uh, so what? What are you going to do about it? And now, um, what I wanted to do is just share what my so what is, what brings me here and why I'm talking with the people that are here is, uh, for me, it brought me to normative theory. 
Uh, and so, you know, Jay and I have an interest in theory, different kinds, but I, I found myself <laughs> bumping into normative theory. And then I've been thinking about this um, historically, the way this works in our world, born of the scientific method, is we start with seeing, we move to understanding, then maybe we move to prediction, and then if, if you're an economist, the optimization, uh, and then there will be prescription that's in there. But our prescriptions come out of our data, all of our research articles, implication for management at the end. Um, if, you're, if you want to lead, lead the research effort, if we're trying to save the world, that's a value perhaps, and then, but you may start with that. So the question is, what does theory look like when you start with values, when you start with the prescription, and then you move to seeing, and then you move to understanding, and then you move to prediction and optimization. And so ultimately you get to how can we optimize a world where love is at the center of what we're doing is kind of where this, this goes. But it's born of that fundamental orientation in, uh, well, for me, it's human dignity. And then love flows, flows out of that. Uh, so what I've been, so that's, there's a cosmic question about what is normative theory. We could have a whole session on that. And the sense is, well, what is that normative theory? And for me, I've been uh, a corporate governance guy. I've been wandering around the stakeholder shareholder conversation forever and a day. Um, and I started teaching the question. I couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out. And then the intuition came is that, for better or worse, that there's a fallacy of composition here, and that a lot of our challenges coming from the stakeholder communitarian perspective is more about what we want from business rather, well, we want it from a discrete firm, but it's a press for business in society and humanity. There's a journal called Business. It's not the firm in society, it's business in society. But we're playing with the theory of the firm and then trying to expand that out. And so Tom Donaldson and I wrote a paper a few years ago called Toward a Theory of Business, and then when we came up with the theory of business, we said this fundamentally has to be normative. What do we want from business and society? And so we rooted that whole paper in human dignity. Um, so we've Jim, moved forward two minutes, I guess. Jim. Peace. Two minutes. <laughs> um, so we move forward, and at the center of it, um, what we realize is we're living in a world, uh, and Tom and I are now, we've outlined the book. We're trying to write a book, a follow-on to this paper. But you can, you can sort out if you did these different levels of analysis. And I'll just go from you know, broad to narrow. Society, business, the firm, the model of the individual, and then the individual's worldviews. If you take um, the homo economicus view at the society level, and this is maybe outside of our realm, but neoliberalism, this is a cartoon view, but you've got neoliberalism up there. At the level of business, it's, and then Jay's behind me, I'm not going to turn around, but it, it's the, the invisible hand of the market that plays out is, I think, the, how that goes broadly. He nodded, but it's not even. Me. He loves me. Um, and then there's the neoclassical theory of the firm, nexus to contracts, et cetera, comes out of it. And then at the root of it is homo economicus. And then um, I've been hanging around with a uh, rabbi um, who told me about Joe Soloveitchik, and he also introduced, uh, or David Brooks has been writing about that. But it's Adam One, if you know his work, but, or if you're reading David Brooks, there's Resume Man. So you have a worldview which turns into Resume Man, and I'll just leave that as the, the orientation. Um, so, but it, that runs out of homo economicus and the theory of the firm. What Tom and I were doing is we have a theory of business and we need a, a model of human behavior. So our model of human behavior is homo dignus, not homo economicus, and then the implication is what it means for the theory of business and we're trying to tie out now what's the world view at the individual level and that's, if you will, eulogy man, Adam too, and there's a whole bunch of work and self construals and identity that we're playing with. And then what does it mean for the theory of the firm? where dignity is at the core of this, and then what does it mean for society if we get there someday? And you heard it here now, we'll be talking about dignitism <laughs> someday, maybe if we're lucky. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing with this. We all have our own journeys, uh, but fundamentally at root is we're here. Why are we here? What are we going to do about it? Um, and that's our own, we have those questions to ask for ourselves. Uh, and then all I would say is, as someone who's I've uh, been a part of the Academy of Management for all my days. I'm very alert to what's the vision and mission for the Academy of Management. Uh, the vision of the Academy of Management is, who knows the t-shirt line? Uh, close. Uh, to inspire and enable a better world through our scholarship and teaching about management organizations. So the question is, how can we inspire and enable each other to bring love, which is just, to me, is just taking human dignity and interaction, and then how you honor someone's Human dignity is with love. How do we bring that into our work? Jay tells us how we might do it with respect to strategic change. How do we do it as a community to inspire that and then maybe create a transformation worthy of the picture I just took uh, 20 minutes ago?
That's it. Thank you. So, um, Michael mentioned my book, Intellectual Shamans, and I've been working in the arena of shamanism for probably 25 or 30 years now. Uh, my teacher says you can be in one of two states, love or fear. Right now I'm terrified <laughs> having to follow these three incredible talks. Um, however, I want to come to a place of love from that terror because the only way to deal with fear is to walk through it. And in many ways we're afraid to talk about, as Jim pointed out, to talk about uh, the idea of love um, in our work. Uh, we, until the humanistic management group came along, we often didn't talk about dignity. We didn't talk about well-being, which is aligned with the idea of wealth, but it's a different form of uh, wealth. It's a different meaning of wealth. And I want to make the analogy between what gives life and love here in this brief talk. So let's just start with a little bit of thinking about what love means. So from a philosophical pr perspective, um, the Greek philosophers give us three definitions of love. Eros, which is what we all think about, so you know, sort of uh, the idea of romantic love, um, the hearts of flowers and the, the uh, romance that we think of when we're love. Philia, friendship, uh, love as friendship and agape, which is the sort of form of universal love. And, and psychologists have given us three other forms. Um, I'm not even sure I can pronounce these. Storage or familial love, um, ludus or playful love, um, pragma or the practical love um, that's uh, based on duty or reason, um, and self-love, philousia. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure how helpful that is as we think about um, what what love is in the context of businesses. Um, you know, so where do we go from there? So I, I, I think we want to think more in terms of perhaps a different perspective on love. So Eric Fromm tells us that love is the act of concern for life and the growth of that which we love. Um, love involves care, commitment, knowledge, responsibility, respect and trust. Some of these ideas have been brought forward according to Fromm. Um, and that first word should be care in that case. So we that. Um, knowledge can lead us to wisdom. And in other work I've defined wisdom as the combination of three attributes um, which are aligned with, in my view, the good, the true, and the beautiful. So it involves um, the good, moral, imagination, the ability to see what Jim just pointed out, the ethical considerations that are available to us in all contexts. So if we think of the current uh, financial model or neoclassical uh, economics model, and we, we love to be told that there's no moral values there, that it's completely agnostic to moral value. But the, the idea of accumulating wealth and material goods is a value, whether our economist friends want to admit it or not. And it's not one that's getting us to where we need to be. It's, dri it's a value, set of values that's driving us off an ecological cliff, as we just talked about in the previous session. Um, so moral imagination, ability to see the ethical considerations in, in a situation. Systems understanding, um, the true. Enough understanding of the systems to see how things are related to each other. So the kinds of considerations that Jay was giving us when he introduced his ideas. And aesthetic sensibility. So, you know, we all see the design characteristics when something is either working well or it isn't working well. So the, the beautiful is very much a part of, of the idea of wisdom, which I would like to associate with the idea of love. All of that in the service of a better, of building a better world. So the, the mission of why are we here, as Jim puts it out, puts, puts in the question, um, is really for me the idea of building a better world. So, um, and all of that to say, love is really concerned with care, responsibility, respect, um, caring, what Rian Eisler calls caring economies, and, the, and humanistic management ideas about well-being uh, well and dignity. 
Uh, our stakeholder relationships when we run good businesses are built on care, respect, and ultimately, as Jay pointed out, love. Um, so if love is concerned with life, then what gives life to people and systems? So here I'm going to draw on a paper that uh, Petra Kunkel and I just published uh, online in um, ON, uh, or Organization in the Natural Environment. Um, and we've searched a wide variety of literatures, everything from um, architecture to uh, biology to John Fullerton's work on regenerative, regenerative business systems to um, uh, uh, work on Weber's work on uh, um, in, in, uh, in enlivenment as opposed to enlightenment. Um, and we drew six principles out. So there are six principles that give life to systems, in our view. One is purpose, intention or purpose. All living systems have a degree of intentionality or purpose. A second is wholeness. Uh, wholeness relates to the word health, hail, integrity, wholeness. Mutually uh, consistent wholeness, but that sense of integrity, that sense that it, you can't take things apart, you can't take living systems apart and have them retain their living quality. You can't take a person or a biological entity apart and have it, have it retain its living characteristics, but, you know, it eventually it will die. Um, boundedness, all, all healthy, system, health, healthy living systems have a sense of identity or boundedness, containment, um, that gives them a sense of this is something that's separate from that. Now there may be nested other systems within that, and there usually are, um, but, but they, each one of those has its own sense of boundedness. Um, emergence or novelty. Living systems have a constant de desire to not to grow, not to grow in the economic sense of <coughs> wealth, maximization, or material growth, but to grow in the sense of develop. And living healthy, healthy living systems develop towards ever greater abundance. Diversity. So diversity is in, in, innately connected uh, with the idea of, um, of these healthy living systems that, have, that are constantly emerging. Connectedness and diversity, then, is, is the, the, the other principle. And these are in no particular order because there is no order, they're part of the system. And then from, uh, from a sense of consciousness. And I want to argue that um, if you look at some of the sort of the way out physics that exists these days, um, it basically tells us that, um, that at the core of um, things that have a proto form of consciousness is, a, is an alignment of the sub elements that are in the system. If you align those sub, sub elements, they seem to have some degree of proto consciousness. If that is the case, then many things that we don't currently think of as having consciousness actually have consciousness, have a form of life, because consciousness and life are um, linked together. And virtually all of the wisdom traditions will tell us, the world's wisdom traditions will tell us that at the core of um, understanding life and understanding wisdom is this idea of love. So I think wisdom, life, love, all are uh, connected constructs that, that we don't typically kind of bring together. Um, so if we think about, if we, oh, if we think about love as a life giver, from notes, this the current economic system of capitalism, I'll just read this because I know some of you can't read it, um, is reflected in a hierarchy of values. Capital commands labor, massed things, that which are dead, of which superior value to labor, to human powers, to, uh, to that which is alive. Um, Rianne Eisler, along the same lines, notes, capitalism pushed these ideas to the extreme, divorced from nature or life, as potential expense, ex at, the, at the potential expense of Earth to support human beings in the future. So we are risking our future because we are not paying attention to what gives life. Um, and love is also, in, in recent research that just came out by Sushanek, um, love is also aligned in this position with truthfulness, investment or commitment, which we know from our even our, the eros sense of love, the sense of love as uh, relationships, um, commitment to each other or commitment to an organization, as Jay pointed out. Um, 
Love is about giving to others, ensuring their well-being. Well-being comes into this. Responsibility for actions and impact. Is this not what we've been talking about for, in corporate social responsibility for the last 40 years? Um, it is about investment and com commitment to a good life. And that, I think, is what Jim was driving us towards. And I think probably what Raj will also be talking about. So inclusive organizations are vital and alive because they have clearly defined purpose, intention, and generativity. They recognize the interconnectedness and the interdependence and relational aspects of what goes on inside them. That is exactly the message Jay just gave us. They have identity and containment, boundaries. They are constantly emerging new things. They, are, they have novelty embedded in them. They are uh, they feature abundance and diversity rather than scarcity and embody resilience and constant emergence in their development. And they have leaders who consciously design these organizations to full purposes that go beyond the selfish, that go beyond just maximizing shareholder wealth, that have some greater sense of being in the world. So, in that context, we want to there's no skip to, um, we want to think about moving from uh, what Bill Frederick called an economizing mindset, I think, and what David Wasleski in a book that we just and I are just and I are just finishing up in a book that we're just finishing up called uh, based on Bill's work, Bill Frederick's work, an ecologizing mindset, a holistic life giving mindset. Thank you. And I think a man that shouldn't need an uh, introduction either, Raj Sasodia is with us, who has created uh, a famously important community that I think has been speaking about love at the center of, of managing capitalism for a long time. And so thank you for being here with us and, and just sharing that kind of perspective to close. Thank you. I feel like a wedding crash here. <laughs> Stepping in for Nancy, uh, and you're happy to do so. Uh, actually, a marketing professor, so I feel much more at home here. I get depressed at marketing conferences. Uh, and I have to say, you know, my journey, just to give you a little bit of background, most of you probably don't know me, but uh, I discovered the power of love in business somewhat accidentally. I was writing a book that started out being called The Shame of Marketing, because I've done 10 years of research showing all the ways in which the money we spent on marketing is actually causing harm. Mm. Trillion dollars in 2004, equal to the GDP of India. Mm. being spent in this country on ads, coupons, and junk mail. What is that doing to customers, for companies, and to society? And mostly we have negative answers to that. So I was going to write a whole book about that. Fortunately, my mentor, Jack Shett, told me, you know, people want to hear about the solution, not the problem. <coughs> so I called it In Search of Marketing Excellence. And then we found a bunch of companies which were spending less but had customers that loved them. And eventually we discovered that it wasn't just customers, everybody loved them. And, uh, and so we called the book Firms of Endearment. Middle <laughs> uh, class companies were offered from passion and purpose. 28 companies, and we discovered a pattern. So they, they took care of all their stakeholders. They literally got people use compassion and love and caring and you know, that passion to describe these companies. But they also had a sense of purpose, the reason why they existed, which was to do something meaningful in the world. Uh, and they had leaders who actually cared about the people, cared about the purpose, and were coming from a place of love and strength simultaneously. And cultures that were rooted in, uh, in trust and, and caring, again, love at the core. So fundamentally, love was a defining element of it. That then led to the founding of the conscious capitalism movement. And now as it's been about 11 years, and as I have continued to think about these things and try to understand uh, more deeply, that has kind of brought me last year to a journey of writing, or trying to write a book about business as healing. So this is called The Healing Organization. And as part of that, I was also turning 60 last year. I got advice from a number of people saying, you better heal yourself before you try to write about it. That was wonderful advice for me. I actually delayed the book by five months. <clears throat> I went on a number of experiences, including having my birthday in the Himalayas with a group, uh, the Shakti group around the masculine feminine integration, a journey to the Amazon rainforest uh, in Ecuador with the Pachamama Alliance, a silent retreat, and a coach for the first time in my life. And I do recommend a coach, by the way. This is a wonderful thing to look at life. And uh, as I gave her my journey and told her the trajectory of what I've done and how I grew up and so forth, 
She saw a pattern there. She said, you know, for the first 45 years of your life, you were trying to live up to your father. You are trying to be like your father. And he's an extreme patriarch, you know, the old, the old school, right? That mentality, hyper-patriarch. And since Firms of Endearment, she said, everything you've done is really you've been honoring your mother with your work. I said, I didn't know that. She said, does your mother know that? I said, I didn't know that. So she actually forced me to call my mother and tell her that. But as I thought about it, I said, what is it about that? It's really that, you know, what does she stand for versus what he stood for? It's really the feminine side, the love. Right? Again, I don't want to generalize saying only women do that. It's masculine, feminine within all. It's the loving side of human beings. Right? And if I then started to uh, look at, in, for this book, what brought us to this point where business has become a place of suffering, where the heart attacks are 20% higher on Monday morning, right? the employee engagement is 15%, 120,000 Americans die every year. Uh, Jeffrey Pfeffer has a new book called uh, Dying for a Paycheck, right? From stress connected to the way we lead and manage and organize. Right? So there's a tremendous amount of suffering at work, financial distress, all kinds of things. So what, why has that happened? Why has business become a source and a place of suffering? And I started to look at the history, and you know, the history of capitalism and democracy are almost synonymous with the history of the United States. And if you look at the founding of this country, it was founded on um, enlightenment values, reason, egalitarianism, individualism, etc. But these are also very mature masculine values, right? But there was no feminine to counterbalance it. And you know, we have founding fathers, we didn't have a founding mother. Abigail Adams was the closest to that, and she tried very hard to get John Adams to incorporate some of that into the declaration and beyond. And she said, if you're a very, very famous lady, you should look it up, please sir, do not forget the ladies. And she concluded, men left to their own devices, I want to become tyrants. Right? And of course, he kind of joked about it and laughed it off. And so, but the fact is, women were excluded from voting, as well as owning property in 240, 250 years almost, to correct that. But simultaneously, in the world of capitalism, which evolved alongside democracy, think about Adam Smith is considered the father of modern capitalism with the wealth of nations. But he also wrote the theory of moral sentiments, which came 17 years prior. That's about the human need to care without regard to self-interest. So I like to say that capitalism had a mother and a father. They were both Adam Smith. <laughs> but we ignored the mother as we do in life. I mean, I kind of took my mother for granted, even though I know what she's done for us. Right? And I think we take that side of our humanity for granted. Business kind of became analogous to a form of war. All of our organizational things, and the language of business, you know, hierarchy and command and control and strategy, tactics, operations, front lines, headquarters, it all comes from the military. And with that, a mindset, right? Hyper-masculine mindset. So, in a way, I call that section of the book, Men Gone Wild. Right? It's a hyper-masculine approach in, in, in on all of these areas. And that led to all of this suffering. So we do need love. We need to counterbalance that. So we need the feminine, right? We need to elevate the mature feminine, caring, compassion, empathy, inclusiveness, etc. That's the other side. But that's also not enough. It's not just about, you know, the, the mature masculine, which is uh, achievement, success, order, structure, discipline, focus, etc. along with caring, compassion. But we also need two other energies. So I call these the four energies. We need the elder energy, which is meaning and purpose and wisdom, and, and being concerned about legacy and things beyond your lifetime. We also need the healthy child energy. We need joy. And we need playfulness. Without that, we don't have creativity. So we really need we, all, we need all of these. The summary phrase we have is we need to be the wise fool of tough love. We need to have wisdom and foolishness. If you look at the Dalai Lama, he embodies wisdom and foolishness. Playfulness, right? He's always giggling. And tough and love. As Martin Luther King said, we must be tough-minded and tender-hearted. So it's that combination of the healthy energy, healthy manifestations of all of these that we need. Unfortunately, the world today, especially I think in the US lately, we don't have that. We have sort of the hyper-masculine, which is domination, aggression, hyper-competition, winning results at all costs. We have the absence of the feminine. We kind of have the dogmatic elder energy of division and, uh, you know, and dogma and, and, and uh, you know, religion, per se. And then we kind of have an adolescent energy as well, which is uh, uh, narcissistic and short term oriented. So that's, I think, fundamentally the, the change that we have to make. And to me, if you really start to think about business, you know, going back to why do we have business in the first place in a free society, governments are not supposed to meet our needs. They simply create the conditions where businesses can then spring up and sense and meet all of our needs. And if we do that in a way that truly starts with the desire to want to serve people and to take care of them, because that's what capitalism is. It's a system for us to take care of each other and simultaneously achieve what we need, right? So if we lead with that energy, that business to me becomes fundamentally about healing. We lead with the energy of serving and taking care and not using and exploiting. And so one way that I express that is that instead of squeezing our employees, which we do, to 
get as much out of them as possible and squeezing our customers, sell them as much as whether they need it or not, and our suppliers, we're still squeezing all of them to get as much as we can out of them. We should be hugging them and doing as much as we can for them. And for the right reasons, not because we can get more. Right? I remember a few years ago, Harvard Business Review had a cover story with a smiley face. It said, happiness is profitable. A lot of CEOs said, okay, let's get some happiness around here. Yeah. <laughs> some smiling faces, right? Well, it's like asking somebody to marry you. And she said, why do you want to marry me? And he said, well, I read that married men live five years longer and they make 30% more money. Seems like a good idea. So we should, marry, we should do the right things for the right reasons. Right? We should marry for love. We should actually take care of people and, and do all of that for love and for the right reasons. So in this book, we have about 30 stories that embody this idea, right? That business can be a place of healing for the people who come there, work there. And you can leave at the end of the day mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually in a better place than when you came and you don't work that matters, your respect and dignity and authentic care in your work. You can be a source of healing for everybody you serve, including customers, make their health and their lives better and your communities and the environment. And we can be a force for healing in the world. And all of that, you know, there are many ways to hurt. There's only one way to heal, and that's through love. Right? And that's really uh, the missing, missing element here. Uh, and, and finally, I want to just tell you one, one of the things that came to me in my self-healing journey as I was... Uh, going through a shamanic healing journey in deep in the rainforest in Ecuador next to a river under the sky with a lunar eclipse going on and a shaman standing over me, you know, waving stuff. I had a vision and the vision came to me and I had gone there and said, I need to learn about healing for myself and I need to learn about healing in the context of business. And, and suddenly I got these four words floating in front of me and, and said, this is what the world of business needs to heal. And it was love, innocence, simplicity and truth. And it forms an acronym, by the way. I love the acronyms. That's list. That's the list. <laughs> love, innocence, simplicity, and truth. And think about how far we've gotten away from all of those in the modern world of business. There's a loss of innocence when you, when you exploit and use people to benefit others. Right? To benefit yourself, you're doing things that you know are not, not the right things for others. There's an extreme level of complexity in everything. I mean, the 2008 financial crisis, a lot of it was because people manufactured complexity right? with all those instruments and derivatives and so forth. And truth, truth seems to have no meaning, as Sandra talked about. Right? What is the real commitment to truth uh, in the world of business? So that, I'll just leave you with the list. Love, innocence, simplicity, and truth. Thank you. It's like mic drop. Uh, <laughs> thank you for these amazing presentations, for this uh, amount of truthful sharing and caring. And um, we do have uh, time for questions, and I, I hope that you sort of ponder the short and question mark ending <laughs> statements. I also want to give the uh, opportunity to uh, you guys here just to maybe comment on what you heard from each other before we go there. Um, anybody feels moved to just add something, share a comment um, on what you've heard so far? You can speak loudly without this. I'm uh, deeply humbled by what I've heard. I'm inspired. Yeah, pick your word. Inspired. I'm in love. <laughs> awesome. I've never had an academy man management meeting like this. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so yeah, anybody that feels moved uh, to to share, can you stand up and share? Tell your name and then... Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Martin Goldsonvall, I'm from the Stockholm School of Economics. Thank you very much for the panel. Um, this is the first time I am at AUM. I'm normally an accounting researcher, so this is <laughs> obviously a very interesting thing. Um, I do research about sports clubs and accounting and emotions. And if we take the theme here, love and inclusive organizations, what we have found, which I think is really interesting, is that when a team wins, <laughs> Everyone is, you know, everything that separates, unite. When a team loses, we love the team, but if you take in the, in the context, football hooligans, they act out their anger in a way that becomes very difficult for the CEO. And today the premiership started, and I don't know if you saw, Manchester United won 4-0 against Chelsea. So what we have now is a situation where the CEO of Manchester United 
won't have any problems whatsoever, maybe a little bit of heavy drinking in Manchester, since it was a home game. And the CEO of Chelsea will think, will our hooligans beat someone on the way back? So given the, the, the theme of inclusive organization, our experience in our research is that, you know, since, since it's so heterogeneous, and the more inclusive you get, the more heterogeneity you create. What's your thought about that? Because I think, I mean, I, I love, by the way, the, the seminar, but it, in terms of simplicity, it seems that love creates a lot of different emotions. And that's what our research is showing a little bit. So I would be curious to get your views on that. Uh, just one, one thing just popped into my head, and, and, and I'll I gotta shut up working. There's a 200 people here, but I'll just um, um, make no mistake. We are we are capable of immense cruelty and incredible joy. And so, uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time in Rwanda in the last number of years, and I've been to Cambodia. I've been, when I was younger, I wanted to go to Germany, etc. If what's interesting is if you look at that, those three in particular, I, whoa, um, the other foot has fallen. I don't know what that foot is. <laughs> um, uh, I looked at the constitutions of Germany, Cambodia, and Rwanda. All three of them begin with human dignity at the center of it. So there's a sense they went too far, and then they realized, OMG, uh, maybe even G, uh, we have to put dignity at the center of who we are, because left uncontrolled, we are hooligans. So is there a silver, well, <laughs> silver bullet, no. Is there a magic, <laughs> is there a magic formula? I, I don't know, but I think it starts, it's got to start somewhere. But, but there's, nothing, there's no naive tiger at all. It's a really interesting uh, story. Um, and what I was thinking is, is um, almost the opposite in one sense, which is um, the CEOs in my last category were in trouble. And it, it was their ability to create deep affect with their direct reports that got to get them out of trouble. And, uh, and so, um, and by the way, totally right on authenticity. You can't fake it. You can't, if, if anyone gets even any impression at all that uh, you're, you are uh, faking this, uh, this, this love, it's over. It's, it's actually much, uh, my guess is it's much worse. I don't know that for sure, but that would be my intuition. So you know, the, it, the irony is that the tougher the situation, the more valuable that love is. And, and now, with regard to the hooligans, that's a whole, that's a, that's a challenging problem. But, but internally, let's put it this way: what is? I would like to, I would like to see the team that loses, and how they come together or not. And if they blame each other and the coach, they'll never improve. But if they rally and love and support, uh, I'm not a betting man, but I bet on. I'm Barbara Crosby, and I focus on uh, management leadership in public and non-profit organizations. But I think my question would apply to for-profit organizations as well. One of the principles that was mentioned connected to Honor Ostrom's work is self-governance. Is the implication of what you're talking about that we must have democratically governed workplaces. So I think uh, Eleanor was talking specifically, specifically about the problem of the commons, sure. and uh, and it's pretty clear that in those settings, um, if you have an organization. Uh, often an informal organization that meets the criteria that were specified, it could be self-governing. Um, I, I, I don't think, it, it, and this is a hypothesis because I don't know, but my guess is the following. I don't think affection and love in an organization means there isn't the boss. There isn't someone who makes a decision. How the decision is made is very different, but it's usually, I would say, I'm not looking at, uh, for a vote. Um, and in the uncertain settings that I, uh, 
I have studied and have been part of, the authenticity of these individuals, uh, these CEOs in these settings, it starts with, you know, team, I don't know, things suck and I don't know why. Totally open, and then coherence, and then direction, and then leadership in more traditional kinds of ways. So it's a dynamic relationship, but, but to, if, if you mean by democratic, we felt that I would say probably no. If you mean democratic, if by democratic you mean inclusive, I would say yes. I would just add a thought to that, that you know, I, I do feel that these kinds of companies have more freedom within them. Uh, there's the idea of freedom from and freedom to, freedom from too many rules and freedom to do things outside of what, uh, what you've done in the past. And there's also much less of what we would call you know, managers and bosses and supervisors and so forth. All of that language actually gets in the way of this. Uh, and, and the mentality behind it, the word boss actually comes uh, you know, from slavery. And, and we have two, you know, nobody really wants to be managed, nobody wants to be bossed, nobody wants to be supervised. People need to be led. People want leadership. That's vision and inspiration, right? So I would say these companies have a lot less management and much, much more leadership and, and much more freedom within internally as well. So I think that's a matter of self, showing respect to people and enabling them to bring the gifts that they have. You know, human beings have extraordinary gifts to give us and most organizations don't create it's like the seed has never been more potent, but the soil remains extremely toxic within most organizations. So people really don't have the opportunity to, uh, to give for that organization what they're capable of. Just, just, just one, one quick thought on that. What I, what I love about coming to sessions like this is you get questions. And so you, I just encoded it as, how do you hold people accountable for indignity and for violations of love, et cetera? What's the control mechanism and the like? And that's a very interesting question. Um, the, the other side of that question is what I've been um, uh, playing with, and again, I, am, I just want to be with fellow travelers and help people help me think about it. But I've been thinking about mercy and atonement and forgiveness, because um, that's the other side. And that's once you control it, is that what's, what does it take to move forward from that? And so I don't necessarily have the answer, but I just wanted to elaborate on your question, and then we'll see where we go with that as well. Okay, I'm going to capture a couple of questions, so if you can just make it very brief so we can have two or three folks who I see and discriminate against the room back there at the side. Just one up here, one up here. I can't see in the back, I apologize, but yeah, two in the middle? Yep. Okay. So, uh, okay, well, why don't you go first then? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Mila Gren. And I'm kind of building on what, what you were saying, and I was wondering the limits of love, the shapes of love, you, you had categories of different types of love. Big mother, uh, I love my kids, and uh, in general I bear no ill will to, to anybody, but if, if somebody were to hurt my kids, I would probably feel very little love towards the ones who are, who are doing it. And I think that we are driven also about the, uh, by the us and them mentality. So having management teams or military teams or, or, or teams like that, uh, it is more natural to us uh, to create love within the bounded, bounded organization. But I think that's not necessarily the biggest problem. The biggest problem is what happens at the limit of love. You know, when we have the bounded area, bounded collective setting where we have. So how could we spread uh, our sort of willingness to love also outside the immediate, immediate group or something within which is uh, natural for us humans to, to love? The limits of love. How do we expand them? Uh, 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 yes, uh, Blue Wooldridge, I'm also a professor of public administration. Uh, and I, I'm interested in following up on the business about the positive side of love, but also the negative side of love. I mean, I assume one could assume that in, in Nazi Germany uh, there was a great feeling of love towards Hitler. Going back to accountability, how can one integrate um, elements of accountability to make sure that the positive or the functional side of love uh, comes through and not the dysfunctional? Yeah. Harry Hulls, Maastricht University and uh, Utrecht University. I'm currently conducting research um, on agape in business. And what we find, and I uh, con concur with what Jay basically said, there's a lot of love in business, 
But there's a kind of inconvenient truth here, a kind of new inconvenient truth, that is, there is a lot of bus a love in business, but it's quite inconvenient to talk about it. Business leaders don't like to talk about or use the word love as such. They prefer care, fellow, fe um, fellow feeling, or respect, etc. But the idea of love, truly caring for each other, is quite available in, in large doses. But how do you capture that? How do you create a dialogue? How do you create a conversation on love? I'm not sure I can answer any of these questions. Um, I would point to Harry's question, I would point us to thinking about what Rianne Eisler describes as caring organizations. And in a sense, we need to, uh, it strikes me that the current way we think about organizations and organizing and our economies and the system that we have is very much um, coming from a place of fear and a place of um, uh, sort of not understanding the whole system but understanding pieces of the system. And so in some level, at some level as educators we need to think about how we educate people so that they move from um, conventional stages of human development towards uh, post-conventional stages where this sort of more expansive view of uh, an encompassing view of multiple perspectives that include both these sort of what I call the economizing, I would call the economizing and the ecologizing, not just one or the other, but both can be present in the same uh, person and, and in the same perspective. You know, how we do that, I'm not sure, but that I think is probably part of the imperative. Let me try to speak a little bit to the second question about um, the limits of love, extending love beyond the organization. Values. So, um, I recently wrote this paper, uh, it was published in the Strategic Management Journal, that makes me following an argument. Um, <coughs> it's a long paper, so getting it simple is going to be hard. Basically, if you treat all stakeholders as if they are fixed claimants, that you write a contract that pays them for what they do, and that's it. They're interchangeable parts. If you treat all stakeholders as fixed claimants, you will not be able to attract the resources necessary to generate an economic profit. Therefore, you can't. if you want to generate economic profit, you can't treat shareholders as your only residual claim. Okay. Now, what does that mean? What that means is management's job is to identify stakeholders whose resources are essential for the creation of economic profits, and then to build a community among those stakeholders where they make co-specialized investments that generate those profits. That's a lot of economic language. Bottom line is, if you don't get your stakeholders to love each other, you don't make money. I hate to be too crass, but I am an economist. So. <laughs> and so, and so, um, and, and then we win, and then we distribute the money, and everyone's better off, and on and on and on. And so, I think that I think that while I definitely appreciate the um, the strong value position um, that we've heard and supported to my core, there's the very practical reality. The the reason that we live in a capitalist society and wealth generation is part of the deal. And we have to figure out a way to bring the concept of love centrally into the conversation of profit generation. And, I, and, and, and you do that, like I said earlier, by finding those stakeholders for whom your success depends critically and then working with them to create a sense of cohesion. Now, the reason that is, extends outside the firm is there's no reason to believe all the relevant stakeholders are inside the firm's boundaries. And, and so, in fact, it creates, it creates a whole bunch of practical and theoretical problems. But, um, so, I, I, so I, I just would point out that, that there, there are limits to love, obviously, but uh, they're not limited by firm boundaries. Last time I made a comment like this,
this. Jim looked across the room and said, will someone give that guy a hug? <laughs> I, I just want to say that the, uh, <laughs> the limits to love are far greater than we normally assume. And I was reminded of this when at one of our early conscious capitalism conferences, the CEO of Whole Foods met the CEO of Trader Joe's for the first time, and they're both very conscious companies. And they both said to each other the identical words. They said, I love you, but I hate you. <laughs> they said, I love you because you're, you make me better every day. Whole Foods have to compete with Trader Joe's on price and on selection and interesting foods and so forth. And Trader Joe's have to compete with them on health and, and, and nutrition and, and all of that. So they're their toughest competitor, but they make them better every day. So this idea of love can extend even to competitors, right? And, and in most business contexts, competitors are seen as the, the enemy to be, to be vanquished. It's actually somebody, it's your teacher, right? So I think the idea of love, really, I think we put our own self-imposed limitations on it. But I think you know, as our consciousness expands, our capacity and our reach of our ability to love continues. It's really infinite, I think. There's no, there's no limit to that. Just a quick, a quick word. I, these, the questions on, on accountability, diffusion, and legitimacy are all profound, I think. Um, and then the question is, how do we answer it? And we've heard our reactions. Um, uh, our, our fearless leader up here gave me an opportunity to uh, respond to an essay David Corton wrote about how to change the world. And I thought deeply about that as best I could. Um, and I found, and it's and even in my own life, is that when we operate at the level of systems and institutions, we can't forget that individuals are lived one at a time. And we can't forget that, uh, well, full stop, and, and, and that means faith, basically, if you will, if the individual is a dependent variable in some form to do, improve their lives with some paternalistic, um, hopefully not colonialistic, hegemonic <laughs> orientation. Uh, there's that. But there's also you as, as an independent variable, what you can do. And so um, the question is, how do we live this ourselves? Uh, and then everybody in this room is a leader. And everyone in this room is a role model. People are looking at you. And we know that. Um, we know that for a fact. But in point of fact, everybody in the world is a role model um, to each other. And so I think a, this diffusion process may happen one person at a time, uh, in addition to coming up with cosmic theoretical um, aspirations and treaties and systems and all of that. That's, that matters. But if, if we don't walk the talk in our own lives, I think we go nowhere. So. At some level, it's about the story we tell ourselves. So, you know, we've been under the um, auspices, if you will, of a story that tells us, as Michael would be the first to say, that we're self-interested only. Um, but if you listen to what David Sloan Wilson told us, if you look into the evolutionary literature, the biology literature, um, that there is a lot of altruism among other beings in the world. And humans are also beings of the world, living beings, born of a living world, as David Corton says. Um, and we could tell ourselves a different story, and that the way the stories that we tell ourselves affect how we be, live our lives and affect how we treat other people. And maybe if we told ourselves a different story, we would have fewer of the kinds of problems that we're. I'm really interested in where the story comes from. I was really struck much by your comments about, you know, we live in incredibly privileged lives. Our jobs are actually remarkable on many, many dimensions. But most organizations are just, many organizations, I don't know this but many, it's just painful places. And they're just stress-driven. And, and I, I, Someone asked me once, well, would you want to go to work for a company someday? And I said, can you imagine having to work, work, work someplace where they tell you what to do and you have to do it, even if it's clearly stupid? <laughs> How did that system get created? Now, there, there's a two, I, I, two ideas. In just So what, my, my first idea is, gee, if it really is this uh, homo economist um, ideology, it gives a lot of power to economists. I don't know if that's, I mean, I'd like, I'd like to understand the history of that. But there's another problem, too, which is uh, in our society, sometimes really bad people and bad organizations do very well financially. And so um, I, wonder, I wonder if the interaction of those, I think a study of the history 
Uh, and you were talking about that a little bit with uh, the evolution of the United States. Um, I, I, I think that's worth doing. And uh, so I don't know the answer, but um, but I don't want to be in a world, even though I'm an economist and use economic analysis, I don't be in a world where where we take the we take the hit for doing all this bad stuff. <laughs> we, we have plenty of responsibility here. Don't get me wrong, but I suspect that that's things going on too. I know we're out of time, but I just did want to say that. The 28 companies on the firms of India will outperform the market 9 to 1 over, know, over a 10 year period, right? So it's not, you don't have to choose one or the other. This is a better path to better profits. So this is, there's a lot of energy here. That's amazing. There's a lot of love here. I, this is, I loved it. I hope you did too. So we are a little over time, which is, uh, I hope, acceptable. Forgive us. Uh, and uh, I think it that ask for more. It's sort of like an obligation to have more of these conversations, more of these outlets. I invite you all to think about that as well. I do give a little plug to the next session at four, uh, at one o, uh, in 109, we have a session on, uh, on dignity <laughs> and inclusive organization with a number of CEOs and Raj will be there. And, uh, and that may be a continuation of, of, of that uh, conversation as well. So thank you all for being here. Please let, give a round of applause to you. Thank you.